So, dear guests, partners, donors, and friends, I'm delighted to see you all uh, at our regional experts panel today. You know, despite the horrific events that are taking place in Ukraine as we speak, I hope for the eventual peaceful resolution of the current crisis. So let me thank our moderator and the presenters who gracefully agreed to speak about such an innovative and truly complicated matter for many as the cryptocurrencies. Frankly, I personally uh, consider those who deal with this kind of topics as really forward-thinking people. I'm happy to see here uh, as the moderator of today's event, our long-term friend, a former colleague uh, within the framework of uh, cooperation with the OEC Academy, Ms. Svetlana Dardanova. We hope to hear a lot of interesting facts and better understand uh, the debate about cryptocurrencies in Central Asia as part of the keynote address of Dr. Michael uh, Lambert. The questions are posing in front of uh, you all today are really tough. Things like the existence of working legislation and regulatory frameworks in Central Asia will conceptualize by our speakers from Unicase Law, one of the leading law firms in the region, Mr. Sanjar Amangeldi and Ms. Lubov Tigai. I'm sure we'll hear a lot of interesting arguments, especially because uh, Unicase Law experts extensively publish about crypto in Central Asia these days. Uh, there is a question, does the region have enough energy capacities to host and attract such high power demanding enterprises, especially in the context of the recent blackout in Central uh, Asia. So our uh, school of uh, analytic uh, alumnus, Kanat Nogoyevayev, uh, will talk at length about that. Do our government have an effective policy to attract miners in the region? Uh, uh, sorry, in the region, and how would that benefit our economies? Is there infrastructure in place to develop uh, crypto mining in the region? Timir Palayev, uh, an expert from Tajikistan, uh, elucidate this question and other hotspots of crypto in the region. I am very much sure our experts will raise more questions in the course of our discussion. But the key moment here is, do we have what it takes to build a crypto future in Central Asia? It's not just the old play. Uh, but a real challenge to conceptualize these things and produce a consistent vision of things that might lead our countries to a more prospect, uh, prosperous future. I hope we hear many insights today. Uh, so just briefly, let me introduce some technical regulations of the meeting. The event is held on, reco on record uh, and is broadcast to our socials. So we'll take occasional snapshots too. And so in case you are not comfortable with that, uh, you may turn off your cameras, but we would really appreciate it uh, if you stay with uh, uh, your cameras on so we all could see each other. Uh, please drop your questions in the chat box during the event and we'll read them out when the time for the QA question comes. And please address your queries, questions to my colleagues in the chat box that have IWPR in their names. Last, but uh, certainly not least, uh, this uh, virtual expert panel meeting uh, is part of the series under the Amplify, Amplify, Engage Information for Democratization and Governments in Eurasia project, funded by uh, Royal Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. And we are very thankful to the Norwegian MFA for being a long-term donor and partner. We are very happy to be holding this event today and look forward to having more events with our esteemed partner in the future. And now I am passing the word to today's event moderator, Svetlana Zardanova. Svetlana, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Abahorn. Uh, my name is Svetlana Zardanova. I am an, uh, a gender associate uh, at the Central Asia Institute for Strategic Studies, Kazakhstan, but now based in Russia. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you wherever you are physically today. Uh, thank you, Abakon, for a detailed overview of uh, what our discussion will be centered around. Uh, and I uh, have so much to add that I'm really looking forward to the presentation and discussions on the topic, which is to be true a terra incognita for me and uncharted for many. Uh, 
Um, and uh, let me first uh, give the floor to our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Lambert, who is a political psychologist and civil um, social engineer working at the intersection of uh, medicine and political science. It is even sounds amazing. Um, he received his uh, degree from, from Sorbonne University and is currently um, an associate research fellow at the OEC Academy in Bishkek. So without further delay, the floor is yours, Michael. Perfect, thank you, Svetlana. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you and to open this panel on cryptocurrency in Central Asia. So um, as we speak, tension in Ukraine are escalating with a Russian military intervention on the way which will ultimately impact the daily life of millions, but also the value of the Russian ruble on the international market, the main currency that is used by Central Asian citizens to send remittances to their family. This highlights both the complexity, but also the interconnectivity of the world we live in, and the relevance of cryptocurrencies for Central Asian citizens, as some of them, some cryptocurrencies, are paged to the dollar. That's the example of Tether, for example and thus offer more stability to the citizens who are using them. But do not get me wrong. Cryptocurrencies are not a perfect solution to international transfer and to transfer in the whole Central Asian region. And it has proven to be very energy consuming, sometimes even damaging the power grid, such as in Abkhazia and in Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan last year. Cryptos are also far from secure. They are in theory. But uh, some applications that are using them, for example, Shibo in El Salvador, have proven to be not so secure and not so private. Nevertheless, today we will discuss several impacts of this technology. As we must remember that we are talking about blockchain technology rather than currency in that case. The two are being distinct. Nonetheless, they are not exclusive. Our speaker will probably come back on that aspect. Before we start this panel, which brings together brilliant mind ready to anticipate what is happening in Central Asia. Because let's face it, blockchain technology is the future of money. The real question about it is whether it will be state-owned or not. So centralization versus decentralization. So um, I would like to remain the main aspect of cryptocurrency before we go, and especially the four fundamental topics that are connected to it. The first one is, of course, politics, or I will say geopolitics. Indeed, we see tremendous differences between countries that have massively adopted cryptocurrencies for payment, for example, El Salvador, as I mentioned it, and others that prohibit trading, uh, trading them. That's the case of China. That's also the case of Turkey. In addition, there is still massive difference between the elderly and the youngster in the cities and also in the countryside with surprisingly some elements and some regions such as Siberia that are becoming up for crypto mining for reasons that sometimes remain quite obscure. And that's something we need to remember. Crypto mining is not something that you can plan so much. You can try to, but not always. So when talking about cryptocurrencies today, it is important to remember that all the countries are different in Central Asia. That needs to be underlined several times and that geographical location affects the way the citizens are going to adopt it. My second point, which... Perfect. <laughs> um, the second point, which should have been actually the first one, is of course the question of energy consumption that is associated with crypto mining. Blockchain technology, as of today, requires, and for the time being, a considerable quantity of energy, which has raised some concern with regard to Bitcoin mining in Kazakhstan after it has been prohibited in China and moved to this area. However, there is also some positive aspect. For example, cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum, so especially with the update, ETH 2.0, are taking this issue very seriously. But it is, of course, pushing to this question of energy consumption, resilience in the whole Central Asian country. Or are really the people or, or are the infrastructure, the network, be able to really handle this crypto mining? While I will avoid getting into detail, it is important to mention that it has also an environmental impact because most part of the electricity that is generated in Central Asia 
is not from renewable energy. And that can also have an impact on, for example, water consumption in an area which is already struggling with this topic. And it can also lead to some social uprising. For example, in 2021, social uprising in Kazakhstan. It was not only related to the autocratic regime, but also to the increase of energy prices and thus the cost of mining cryptocurrencies in one of the countries that is producing most part of it. And Central Asia is not an isolated case. I will mention the yellow jacket in France, truck driver in Ottawa and in Brussels. So um, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Central Asia is just one of these areas. The third point is the legal aspect and the regular aspect of crypto mining and cryptocurrencies in general. While cryptocurrencies now have a brighter or let's say a more transparent image than before, or at least are mainstream, let's call them that way because they can still be used for money laundering and also for terrorism. Um, but we need to remember that the taxation is very problematic. How to tax cryptocurrency is like how to tax a piece of art, which many countries actually simply don't today. We don't tax art because it's too complicated to evaluate what is the price. So um, how do we assess the price of something? Um, is it the value on the short run, on the long term? Uh, should we tax the transaction? Or maybe should we tax the ownership of cryptocurrencies? That's actually a huge question. That's very problematic for many states. They don't find any answer, which is why they simply prohibit it. Also in terms of law, um, with the right, I mean, who is having the right to have some cryptocurrencies or not having them? Is it a basic right for people to do what they want with their cash? If people have the right, for example, to buy some US dollar or euro, well, why are they not allowed to buy cryptocurrencies? That's a question, of course. Is it because it's more gambling? Is it because it's not gambling? There's this question of, uh, as I say, the law in general, or do we consider cryptocurrency? And Last but not least, my fourth point is education. The fact that we are having this event right now highlights the real problem when it comes to blockchain, crypto mining, cryptocurrencies, call it the way you want. It is a lack of knowledge of the general public about this technology. So we need to educate citizens in Central Asia about actually not only what money is. It's always surprising to me that Marco Polo is mentioning that the first banknote he has ever seen was in Central Asia. And yet, when we are talking about cash, when we are talking about money, not even going to cryptocurrencies, many Central Asian citizens just accept the way it is. They just don't question the policy of the central banks. So education regarding to what is cash, what is currency, should be and should become a huge part of, um, let's say, one of the pillars of education in all Central Asian states. So as you can see uh, from this short keynote, more questions than answers so far, uh, which is why I would like to open the floor to our speaker today. First of all, because they are from Central Asia, because they know the area way better than I do. And uh, I'm really happy to see that there is an increase of expertise in this domain. And today we will cover cryptocurrency mining in Kyrgyzstan, legal aspect and legal form in Kazakhstan, much needed, technological, social, and economic benefit in uh, Tajikistan, an area where we should speak way much more about, cryptocurrencies, and also regulatory and cryptocurrencies in Uzbekistan. So I let the floor to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for your um, for touching upon all the aspects that crypto can bring to the region, starting from the opportunities and to the risks. Um, and um, now let's proceed to our first speaker. Uh, Mr. Kanat Nogoybaev, who is a researcher and an alumnus of Kapar uh, Analyti uh, School of Analytics, uh, who will be talking about the present and future of crypto mining in Kyrgyzstan amid energy crisis. Um, and crypto mining is an energy intensive process. And uh, do you think the country has crypto uh, hydroelectric energy capacity uh, to make this viable sector for the country? Uh, Kanat, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, as you know, as was mentioned before, the Central Asia and the global market is now facing a lot of issues with the scarce of electricity. And it was like a trouble after the pandemic and the economic crisis. And it's normal situation for Central Asian countries where the blackout is a normal 
for some countries and for some regions. And as you know, the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan recently faced this mass blackout that was uh, caused by the, uh, by the old, old uh, hydroelectric stations and uh, uh, the not enough like a capacity that was not provided by the authorities of our countries. And now most of, of them is blaming the miners for this problem. It's like uh, the uh, authorities of Kazakhstan saying that the problem of uh, scars of electricity is causing by the uh, miners and mining companies. And they say it's like in Karaganda or in Almaty, it's a lot of troubles because the uh, miners using more energy. The same problems they are facing within Kyrgyzstan where the uh, authorities said that due to miners, we don't have enough electricity. However, the problem was early and the problem is not about miners. The problem is about the Soviet uh, old system of hydroelectric uh, stations. It's not a problem of mining companies. Of course, they're using this energy. However, the, as you know, the level of uh, water in Taktagul hydroelectric station, the main power station in Kyrgyzstan is very low. And 10 years ago, we already faced with the scars of electricity. And this uh, happens one more time uh, today. And the problem of uh, um, capacity is uh, raising day by day. What government can do for to resolve this issue? As you know, as was mentioned by Mikhail, after the Chinese legislation change, most of the Chinese companies comes to the Central Asia. The uh, price of electricity is very low. However, they're using like mostly illegal uh, ways and approaches to, to use this energy. And when the government authorities said, yeah, the problem with this miners and we should ban all the mining companies that still exist in our countries, is a way to corruption and bureaucracy that uh, happened after you ban something. You know that in our countries, it's uh, like when you ban something, it's not, that, it's not a guarantee that it's not will really work illegally. And it's a way to, to corrupt these uh, people, like, like uh, situations when some of the representative of electric power stations is using their homes and their houses for mining cryptocurrency. And this trend is happening right now. What can do the, um, in terms of legislation? As you know, Kyrgyzstan, the national, for instance, National Bank of Kyrgyzstan already announced that the cryptocurrency is a future and we should work closely on this, uh, on this legislation. However, the miners still face with the problems uh, from security committee and some of them like uh, have troubles with the operations because they say, no, no any legislation, we can stop your work and it's okay for us. In Kazakhstan, you know, the president said we should regulate this uh, sphere. However, uh, they are not satisfied with the uh, current tax uh, legislation. And they say most probably we should like reject from these mining companies or maybe use alternative energy. I want to mention that uh, in Central Asia, uh, we have like some legislations that they, you can use your crypto cryptocurrency or mining companies if you use the alternative energy. However, the uh, scars of uh, wind energy, the no any uh, nuclear energy station here is a trouble for the companies to use. What type of recommendations we can uh, give to the government? For, for, well, first of all, it's about government and business collaboration. They don't now know any legislation uh, regarding the tax exemptions or equipment necessities you know a lot of equipment comes from the china however the custom tax is very high and they can do some exemptions for the investors who are like providing this uh, equipment for their um for their mining companies the second one it's a, a potentiality of hydropower electric stations like a small ones you know, the, the potential is very high, especially in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, the country school has a lot of uh, water and can use their rivers. And actually they can build together with these investors joint, jointly this type of power electric station. 
the cost of one uh, small power electric stations is around uh, four thousand uh, dollars, and it's like it's a it's a fair price for like half a million to to build a, a, a station that provides enough energy for you. And as a government can propose, and some of this energy can provide it to the areas uh, near your station. Uh, and it's uh, normal international practice, uh, like in uh, example of Canada in Argentina, they already agreed on joint construction of energy electric station in Argentina. And some of this power will be used by the local people who are living there and now don't have enough infrastructure and government also can provide such type of great projects uh, on sale. Another, another example, it's about the old hydropower electric stations that also can be used, like example in the United States, some of old uh, hydropower electric stations now using for the mining companies. And it's also alternative for them. And it's good choice and it's good option for the government to, to, to equipment. Another one is the development of alternative uh, energy. It's like, you know, that we have like wind energy and river energy and the Kazakhstan also, and Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan now are thinking about the nuclear energy. What can they do regarding this issue? So it's so-called green energy. We can't say that the nuclear um, station is a good option for the countries. However, if they do this work, now the mining companies can use this energy. It's like in Ukraine, most of the mining companies using this uh, uh, energy for their crypto, uh, for their mining. And the, another one point, and it's also important, it's not only about mining, it's also about the cryptocurrency operations that now is not legal in our countries, no, like no any regulations regarding this, like in Ukraine where you can free you have free market and you can buy something by this cryptocurrency. However, we still have a trouble. And you know that Russia now put a legislation regarding the cryptocurrency operations and we will face the troubles with this legislation as well in the future. And the last point that I want to mention, it's uh, about the research and international experience. No need to, to to think about the new regulations. You can use the base of United States. For instance, United States is an example of good uh, regulations regarding and legislation regarding the cryptocurrency. And Central Asian countries can use this opportunity to take some knowledge from them and to use this opportunity to know how to regulate. It's not only about like taxing everything and additional prices and to, to, to cost for instance, like Iran did. It's more about the finding a joint solution. It's more about finding the good compromises between two, two uh, sides. And the last one point, it's like no need to, to push mining companies to pay more. No need to say that we should ban all these mining companies and no need to blame them. It's more about to find compromises and Central Asian countries can benefit, mutual beneficial. And this is mutual beneficial for all the sites. And they can benefit from the infrastructure projects, from the investment that they provided, and also from the new world where the cryptocurrency will be more stronger. And uh, we should use this opportunity like 50 years ago, the, some countries of like Asian Asian countries use the opportunity of like building the modern technology, and we as a country should do this step for the bright future. Okay, that's all from my side. If you have any questions, I'm all ready. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanat. Um, uh, just a reminder: please type in your questions in the chat. Uh, we will get back to them um, when discussion is open. Um, and now let's delve into legal aspects of uh, crypto mining and move to our next uh, speaker, Sanjar Amangildi, who is a partner at, uh, in the Unicase law firm. Um, 
and got his degree from Kimep University and University of Ljubljana, if I'm saying this right, um, and who will be talking about legal aspects and legal form of business structure of crypto co companies in Kazakhstan. The floor is yours, Sajjad. Greetings, everyone. It's my sincere pleasure to, to participate at your panel. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry for not being able to turn on my camera, some problems, some technical problems. And for this reason, I will demonstrate my um, PowerPoint presentation. So let's start. Can you see? Okay, sure. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, in the beginning of 2021, in January, there were some problems, political problems in Kazakhstan, and um, there was no there was no internet, no insight in the future, and total blackout, and miners didn't know what to do, and whether they will be able to mine here. Um, but now, now the, uh, the problems is almost solved, let's say almost solved, there's still some problems, but at least there are no riots now. So um, after that, after everything started to calm down, uh, President Tokayev said that uh, he, he wishes um, to, uh, to increase the, the mining tax. Uh, which was presented in the beginning of the January 2022. Uh, so he said not to ban the mining, and he didn't wish to say to mine uh, goodbye to the miners, but he wished to get some profit from it. And I think he understands that the mining and crypto is the future, uh, and Kazakhstan wants to be in the future too. So let's start with my presentation. So uh, the legality of mining in Kazakhstan, um, as you may know, mining crypto is legal here, but possessing crypto is prohibited. Uh, it means that companies who come from outside of Kazakhstan or maybe some local companies, they able to mine uh, cryptocurrency, but they're not able to sell it, to possess it. So in general, the uh, the miners they will uh, they will just uh, open the company in Kazakhstan and some other company in other jurisdiction where the cryptocurrency is uh, not prohibited, where it's legal, and generally they mine and provide the hash rate services to such companies and just send the miners to the to the parent to companies. Uh, after that, they will be able to do anything with that cryptocurrency. So uh, another thing is uh, Astana Financial Center. Uh, Astana Financial Center is International Financial Center, AFC, uh, is a special economic zone where the, um, where the jurisdiction is English law. And uh, unlike in Kazakhstan, in the other, uh, the mainland, let's say this, um, there, my uh, cryptocurrency, uh, possessing cryptocurrency, transferring it, buying it, selling it, is legal, absolutely legal. So uh, another thing is uh, is the mining fee. Uh, so as I said, President Tukayev uh, has introduced a law which will uh, which will tax the uh, additional one Kazakh tenge per one kilowatt consumed by the, uh, by the company uh, and it entered into force in January uh, 1st, 2022. 20, uh, and later he said that he wants to increase that tax. So it means he sees the future in it, in the crypto and he wishes to get some benefits from it. So another things, another contradiction in the legislation, uh, which is not, which is not developed yet for the miners, was the introduction of the, was the, not introduction, yeah, introduction of the ministry, uh, the, the draft, uh, introduction of the draft order from the Ministry of Energy, uh, which said that totally uh, consumption of energy by the mining companies 
should not exceed 100 megawatts and one megawatt uh, for one company. But um, uh, in practice, this, uh, this order has never been adopted. And uh, miners with a higher capacity, like maybe 200 or 100 megawatt, they're still mining uh, at the places. Uh, so another thing is the legal form of the company in Kazakhstan. Um, so in general, they have two options. Uh, foreigners, they have two options. Uh, the first option is uh, um, to open a foreign company in, in the jurisdiction, in any jurisdiction where the cryptocurrency is legal, and then open an LLP in Kazakhstan. And this LLP will be not just uh, the owner of the cryptocurrency, they will be just providing the hash rate service uh, to the parental company. And in the end, they will just maintain the crypto miners, uh, sign the contracts and get some uh, uh, service uh, fees from the parental company and send the uh, cryptocurrency back to it. Um, so in general, this 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 scheme is legal. This scheme is legal. Uh, another another option is to open the uh, company in the AFC where uh, the, the possessing cryptocurrency is legal, and there is a English law jurisdiction, as you know, and then open another company in Kazakhstan, limited liability company, limited liability partnership in Kazakhstan uh, and to use the same scheme uh, like uh, as I said before the uh, the company the local company in Kazakhstan shall provide the hash rate service to the company the uh, C and then send the final product the the mined cryptocurrency to the parental company after that the company at the AFC can do whatever it wants uh, to put it on, on um, like uh, accounts or maybe open a bank account in Switzerland or other countries where the uh, exchange of the cryptocurrency to fiat currency is legal. Um, so that's the basic for the legal forms. Another thing is, uh, is when the companies, they come here in Kazakhstan, they ask, uh, what it takes to be a white miner. As you know, as you may know, there are two types of miners, the grave miners, uh, they're illegal miners. They just bring their uh, miners to Kazakhstan and mine illegally. They don't have documents. They uh, do not um, notify the government or other authorities in Kazakhstan, uh, unlike white miners. So in general, there are three things general three things uh, which you need to be a white miner. First of all, it's um, technical conditions. Uh, technical conditions provided for the data center, especially data center, not for the other things. Um, uh, the technical conditions must be issued by the national uh, electricity provider, Kigok. Uh, and it should indicate exactly that it was given for the, uh, for the, exact capacity and for the uh, for the data center. And another thing is land. Uh, first of all, um, lands, they're, they're like, uh, they distinguish in the types. It's like maybe for agricultural reasons, maybe for the forestry, uh, maybe national parks and other things. The, um, the land which is provided to the to the crypto mining companies should be appointed as the industry or like uh, for the industry or transport or communications, space activities, defense, national security, and other non-agricultural purposes. So if the land, the documents on land, they indicate this, um, this purposes, uh, it is legal for the crypto mining company to own it or to lease it. Uh, and the final thing is power purchase agreement, PPA. Uh, uh, the, the power purchase agreement uh, should be with the guarantee tariff because in case it doesn't have the guaranteed tariff, um, the, 
the tariffs imposed by the government will increase and like the increasement of the of such tariffs are are provided every year so uh those things are the things you need the features of the white miners and another thing is gray mining uh usually uh, like uh, recently i mean recently there has been news, a lot of news that uh, the government, the police uh, caught a lot of gray miners like uh, last last week, they they found uh, gray miners uh, for the capacity of 202 megawatts. It's like one city. Um, and they usually prosecuted, prosecuted under the article 214 uh, of the criminal code, which is illegal entrepreneurship. So basically, uh, that's it about the legal aspects in Kazakhstan. And in addition, I would like to tell that, um, yeah, they're the future for the Kazakhstan and their future for the Central Asia in crypto world. Just a second. I, I, how to stop the demonstration? Oh, I can see it's just a second. Yeah, sorry. And uh, I'd like to say that there is a future for Kazakhstan and Central Asia with regard to the um, crypto mining. And um, maybe, maybe it will be renewable energy, maybe. But still, there's like uh, right now, the uh, renewable energy is not developed yet. For the to bring to bring capacities uh, the right capacity for the miners especially uh, i heard that uh, one of my colleagues uh, today speaker said that there is a future in um <clears throat> in um, nuclear energy but uh, currently uh, it's all just talks and uh, speculations because uh, as for my understanding, uh, if they, if the government in Kazakhstan in Central Asia, they will accept the uh, the nuclear energy. They will um, they will provide the legal base for it, the the construction for it. It will it may take up to seven or maybe six years. Uh, and as you know, the uh, the time for the for the miners is very crucial. Uh, well, yeah, that's it about Kazakhstan and legal aspects in crypto mining. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sanjar, for your thoughts and insights into legal aspects of crypto in Kazakhstan. And we move to now next speaker, uh, Timur Palayev, who is senior engineer in A1 Voiha, um, the organization that works with state agencies and financial organizations in Tajikistan and across the region. Uh, and uh, Timur will be talking about uh, the technological, social, and economic benefits of cryptocurrencies in Tajikistan and Central Asia uh, broadly. Uh, and um, my question would be like, can this, um, can, um, crypto uh, mining translate into a new vital sector for less financially um, fortunate states like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. And the floor is yours, Timur. Thank you, Svetlana. I hope uh, you can hear me well. So good day. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for a chance to speak up. I already uh, as already been mentioned, my name is Timur Palayev, yes, and I would like to use this platform not only for my monologue, but also uh, for trying to initiate a dialogue on this issue. So don't hesitate to write uh, any of your questions in the chat. And uh, I'll try to speak about the main benefits uh, some pros and cons <clears throat> cryptocurrencies can bring to the table about situation in Tajikistan, Central Asia, and I will try to answer the question in, in hand. Is there a future for, for cryptocurrencies in Central Asia? And at the end of my speech, I'll try to come up with some uh, non-obvious conclusions. And of course, I will try to answer to your question, Svetlana. Uh, 
Also, I would like to mention, and please uh, keep that in mind, that we are talking today about field, which is still pretty much theoretical, have uh, theoretical features and uh, is developing. So while we are talking about cryptocurrencies, we should have that in mind. Uh, so what uh, benefits cryptocurrencies uh, can bring in general? Yes, uh, let's talk about uh, social and economic advantages. I will try start about with social advantages. Uh, in general, cryptocurrencies uh, help to remove the middleman from the trading, from the money deals, uh, let's say, and uh, take the place uh, where banks used to stay. And so they, in other words, we can say that they help transfer money directly from one to another. Uh, by using cryptocurrencies, transactions, transaction of money, uh, let's say, uh, become easier. Uh, you can use just simple wallet uh, for transferring money from one from one uh, account to another. This is much cheaper because transactions in cryptocurrencies, they uh, require low fee or no fee at all. Uh, depends on cryptocurrency. They are much faster uh, than bank transactions, uh, which can take uh, up to three, four business days. Transactions in crypto uh, may happen just a matter of minutes. And Transactions in crypto are usually more secure because there are no human factor in it. Technology does all the job and all the transactions are encrypted heavily by algorithms. And uh, because of that feature, cryptocurrencies are heavily used uh, in the countries with volatile national currencies. For instance, Nigeria, Vietnam, and Philippines are top three countries with the highest percentage of cryptocurrencies users. Also, cryptocurrencies are very popular in the countries with emerging economics, such as Turkey or India. In addition, it uh, and uh, previous speakers uh, mentioned that too, it may be good for the states if they can regulate mining by tax revenues. It will boost the economy and uh, bring money to the state uh, in form of taxes. But uh, as far as I know, such a regulation is not available, it's not developed yet in Tajikistan. Uh, so let's move next. And I'll just, uh, now I just want to talk about some downsides of cryptocurrencies. And this will uh, bring me to, no to my uh, next point. Uh, uh, I just want to briefly cover the downsides. First of all, as already been mentioned, mining or in other words, emission of uh, cryptocurrency requires a lot of computing power and that respectively requires a lot of energy. So this uh, is a big downside of cryptocurrencies because this may have uh, and having negative impact on climate and burning because of the burning process and so, and so on. Also, another downside is there are a lot of hacking and scam is happening. Uh, by the way, I want to apologize about the uh, outside noises uh, as for I'm not alone in my office. So uh, a lot of hacking and scam is happening. For instance, uh, I don't know, maybe you have heard about uh, the Squid Game show on Netflix. And uh, there was, uh, there even was a Squid token, Squid coin. Uh, a form of uh, cryptocurrency and a lot of people uh, bought this cryptocurrency it went really high and then the creator of this cryptocurrency just uh, left with the money uh, and so this is still this is the field where a lot of uh, scam is happening but that always happens when there are innovation and people try to find new ways they make mistakes and so on and so on so this uh, just shows that the field is growing also, uh, one interesting downside of uh, cryptocurrencies that I really want to mention is that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cryptocurrencies help us to remove the middleman. Uh, for instance, banks, but cryptocurrencies and crypto transactions, uh, crypto field, crypto markets, they tend to be really uh, complicated for some of people. And uh, very, very usually uh, they uh, use the third party companies to help them uh, to stay on the market, uh, to be on that market, to uh, mine coins. And uh, 
we came that we came to the point where we already using the middleman, but in the other way, not in like the shape of the bank, but the shape in the shape of some third party company that is here. The, um, and therefore we are again in the same place. But still the technology is developing and overall removing banks as middlemen may still be a good thing. And finally about the uh, about downsides, uh, as already been told, cryptocurrencies are very volatile and they are not backed up, uh, for instance, with gold, like uh, usual currencies. And uh, for example, one tweet from Elon Musk uh, can uh, change the currency rating uh, drastically. And for example, we can take Dogecoin, uh, the cryptocurrency that was created uh, for fun based on an internet meme of a dog. But uh, pretty soon, uh, some people that held a lot of that currency became uh, really in a real dollar millionaires. So, and also another downside is that uh, cryptocurrency not really accepted as a form of payment uh, in uh, many spheres, in many shops, in many ways, and so on. So this is a controversial theme. And from one point, uh, cryptos have, have these major benefits. Yes, uh, on the other hand, uh, they are still raw and uh, somewhat in the gray zone. They are not acceptable mostly and not prohibited either. Uh, and uh, I want now to move on the situation in Tajikistan and Central Asia. As you may heard and already mentioned again, uh, China, one of the world leaders in mining cryptocurrencies, restricted crypto market. And uh, that caused immigration of mining farms from China to some uh, places where it's still uh, not banned. And Central Asia seemed like a good place to go because uh, this region has one of the cheapest electricity in the world. And uh, let me leave Chinese uh, mining farms and just for a second and look at Tajikistan. Uh, less than half of the percent of population of Tajikistan have some sort of cryptocurrency. And biggest Tajik media, uh, they had an article several months ago where they stated, I want to quote that, that Tajikistan could be leader in mining cryptocurrency. And this requires just liberal legislation and intellectual resources. But uh, in my opinion, that uh, would not be enough. Uh, I know personally that in Tajikistan, we have several very big mining farms and they are facing uh, similar issues. From time, to, from time to time, they have an issues with electricity and with the internet. And basically for mining, uh, you need stable energy, stable internet, and uh, hardware itself. Hardware can be bought from anywhere, but energy and internet is an issue in Tajikistan. Uh, for example, still in winter times, in some regions of Tajikistan, we have blackouts. And uh, unfortunately, and the internet is controlled by the Ministry of Communications. They have such thing called switch, single switching center. Uh, through which uh, all of the internet comes and goes. And this is the main reason why internet is slow and unstable. And uh, blackouts in winter are also a common thing in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, Turkmenistan don't have stable internet either, it's Tajikistan. And you already mentioned everything that I would like to say. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan recently uh, have been hit by a power blackout. And uh, that issue actually showed that electric grid in Central Asian countries is old and not stable and not ready to support large scale crypto mining activity. And uh, stable energy and internet are much more important for mining than cheap electricity. That is why Tajikistan and Central Asia may extract benefits from cryptocurrencies and mining only when there will be stable energy grids and internet. I'm not touching legal aspects in here, although they are very important. But I believe previous speakers uh, talked about uh, legal aspects uh, and did their job really great. And uh, my topic is called uh, technological, social, and economical benefits for of cryptocurrencies for Tajik and Central Asia. But I barely talked about technological benefits. That's because I saved it for the last. And uh, that is my opinion that I would like to say now. As I mentioned earlier, situation is controversial, but I think that when we are talking about cryptos, we have to look deeper 
both literally and figuratively. We must look at technology, which is the foundation of Bitcoin and many other currencies, uh, and which was mentioned by Michael. The technology is called blockchain. Blockchain is an immutable ledger, which stores data in the form of blocks linked to each other. And the technology makes possible all the benefits cryptos are bringing, but its usage is not limited only by cryptocurrencies. And I think that we may use blockchain to bring some real value to our societies by creating immutable, anonymous, transparent, distributed systems. For instance, for selling real estate, uh, elections, trading, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, just one example I want to bring in here, blockchain provides platform on which, uh, for example, we can build tool for elections, which will be immutable. Uh, in other words, uh, which you cannot uh, change, uh, which will be um, transparent and uh, private, anonymous. So you will have a transparent, anonymous, uh, immutable tool for elections. And uh, that system uh, that will be built upon blockchain may be much more economical in terms of electricity and network usage. Uh, that depends on how it will be configured and uh, designed from the scratch. So uh, concluding what uh, I have said, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, definitely have future in Central Asia, but there are some energy and internet prob problems that should be solved first. But due to all the hype around cryptos, we now know about something that lies in the foundation, blockchain, and that is the thing that deserves more focus on it, uh, in my opinion. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timur. Um, I think we will continue when discussion is open. And we now move to our last but definitely not least speaker, Lyubov Tigay. Uh, Lyubov is uh, an associate at the UNIK law firm with a degree in commercial law from the Westminster University in Tashkent and European Studies for the Seba University. Um, so Lyubov, what is your take on regulation of crypto in Uzbekistan and what are the prospects for individual and commercial miners in the country? Thank you and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for giving the floor and thank you for Timur Palai for such a good discussion uh, about Central Asia. And now I will join my presentation on the topic of crypto activities in Uzbekistan, especially about regulations, restrictions, and prohibitions. You see? Is it okay? Yeah, it seems it is. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as uh, Svetlana told, my name is Lyubov Tigai, and I'm associated at UK law firm in Uzbekistan, in Tashkent office. Uh, and today I would like to speak about legal norms for crypto activities, especially about regulation restrictions. And first of all, I would like to mention some uh, facts about Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is one of the countries in Central Asia, and uh, the, uh, Uzbekistan focuses more on attraction of foreign investments, uh, especially to such sectors as energy, construction, financial, and other sectors as much faster. Uh, and today, I want to tell you that we have a huge problem in Uzbekistan on uh, renewable energy sources that will fuse affect the regulation and tariffs of crypto assets and crypto sectors at all. Well, we have some main legal acts that regulate crypto activities in Uzbekistan. As you can see, the first one is the decree on measures to develop digital economy, the decree on measures to organize operations, uh, the decree on establishment of the fund to support digital economy and development, uh, as we can say, digital trust. And the uh, last two is the crypto cryptocurrency trading rules and crypto exchange licensing order regulations. Well, uh, starting about uh, telling uh, about crypto exchange market, in 2018, the president of the Republic of Uzbekistan signed the decree uh, on the organization of the activities of crypto exchanges. And the decree outlined uh, the main directions uh, that uh, a crypto exchange is an organization that provides an electronic platform for the exchange, purchase, sell, uh, that means buy or sell crypto assets and cryptocurrencies. 
A crypto asset is a set of records in the blockchain that have a value and an owner. Uh, the activities related to the turnover of crypto assets and crypto exchanges are not subject to the legislation on securities and exchange activities. I'll tell you later about this. Uh, and uh, for the implementation of industrial mining, um, the land plot are provided without uh, providing an electronic auction. Sorry. As well, uh, the crypto exchanges uh, have been granted the right to receive remuneration for the services provided, including crypto assets, uh, set it amount and the procedure for charging trading participants and to organize exchange transactions with the residents and non-residents of Uzbekistan. Uh, but the activities carried out by crypto exchange are subject to ICT. If uh, you're interested in this question, uh, you can feel free to uh, connect uh, to Unicase for firm. Uh, we can send you our presentations and uh, topics on this question. Uh, after signing uh, the loan crypto assets, uh, only one crypto exchange uh, was opened in Uzbekistan. And this is a project of a uh, Korean company, Kobe Group, and with the support of the uh, state of Uzbekistan, and namely Uznex. At the moment, Uznex is active and provides users to make operations through its platform, electronic platform. Okay, and we, if we are talk about buying a sell crypto assets in Uzbekistan, I want to mention that uh, foreign citizens have no restrictions. They can buy and sell um, crypto assets through local crypto exchanges. But restrictions more affected to the local residents. Uh, those uh, citizens of Uzbekistan uh, have the right to sell their crypto activities, but has no right to buy it. Dear um, report, I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, could you please move the slides because we're still on the first page on the on the uh, on on the cover of your presentation? Okay, sorry. Uh, and As I told, um, uh, restrictions that affect uh, local uh, residents is that uh, local residents can only um, buy crypto activities and crypto securities, but has uh, only sell, but has no right to buy from any electronic platform as well from the local crypto exchanges. Any, any anonymous transactions uh, through the uh, crypto exchanges and through the, any electronic platform are prohibited in Uzbekistan and always monitoring by the national agency under the president of Uzbekistan. And it's very serious. Uh, but if we will talk about taxes, um, according to the legislation, um, as, on measures to organize operations of crypto exchanges in Uzbekistan, all transactions related to the turnover of crypto assets are not taxable. And this is a really good fact that attract foreign investors to join Uzbekistan market. I'm sorry again, Lyubov, uh, do, you, um, do you move the slides or it's just on the front page? Because it's not moving for, for us. As I can see, we are now on the slide uh, for mining. Okay, so. Um... No, unfortunately, we cannot see uh, any slides that you were showing. Yeah, now it's changed, I think. Perfect. But the presentation is amazing. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> it's like, it's really good. With the slide, it's even better. So deserve to be mentioned. Thanks. Thank you very much for the support. <laughs> Despite strict, uh, strict legislation, uh, the mining in Uzbekistan is allowed. Uh, according to the legislation, we have two types of mining. Uh, this is industrial mining uh, with the use of more than 100 of kilowatts per hour and individual mining. And uh, for the industrial mining, the state provides land plots without an electronic ocean in special territories. And these special territories uh, determined by uh, Ministry of Energy, uh, Uzbek Gidra Energy, and together with other state bodies. 
at the end of 2019, the rules for the use of uh, electric energy was supplemented by a clause that established separate triple uh, tariffs for miners. And in my opinion, this is a really huge problem that prevent miners to enter Uzbek market um, collectively. In January, but in January 2020, the leadership of national agency under the president of Uzbekistan announced at a press conference that uh, they are going to create a national mining pool um, with the tariffs that would be generally established uh, in different ways. And uh, this draft of resolution uh, was published uh, last year, uh, and uh, it's uh, about industrial mining activities are subject to licensing and private mining is subject to registration by obtaining uh, the status of mining pools participants. And membership in this mining pool are obligatory for both for industrial miners and for individual miners. However, uh, to these days, the project hasn't been put into operation and all miners are still paying triple tariffs. This fact is due to the fact uh, that uh, Timur and as my colleagues told, uh, we have a shortage of electricity in some regions and uh, we have some boom of uh, exceptions uh, from electricity one month ago in January uh, for all Central Asia uh, countries, this for Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. And that's why at the beginning it was mentioned that uh, for today we have uh, lots of energy projects related to energy, to renewable energy projects such as installation of uh, solar and power plants um, in all regions of Uzbekistan. And also, I want to mention that illegal mining in Uzbekistan is uh, severely punished up to criminal liability. And to summarize my conversation today, crypto regulation in Uzbekistan doesn't affect many aspects, which makes the structure more vulnerable for both investors and for the state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Libor, for your presentation and insights. And um, I think we now move to a uh, discussion. Uh, I already see some activity in our chat with the questions. So I will read the questions out loud uh, and uh, any of you can jump on the question. Um, so the first question is from Hugo um, and it reads, um, beside the miners themselves and the local authorities, what is in general the nature of electricity companies in Central Asia, which are also ones of the main actors of the mining development? Are they mostly state owned or private? Thank you. Who would like to take that? Actually, it was a response uh, regarding the Kazakhstan. And I can say regarding the Kyrgyzstan, for instance, the most of the energy uh, stations is under the government control. It's like government monopoly on the electricity. We have like uh, government organizations are responsible for this. Uh, regarding the private ones, it's mostly regarding the small hydropower electric station. So for now, the small ones, is a private ones and they also have some agreements with the government and it's opportunity for miners and for the government as well to attract these investors or middlemen who can build the such type of small hydroelectric power station thank you kanat um the next question is from joseph karaneo simon in kazakhstan uh renewables make up to one percent of energy grid Will growing the cryptocurrency industry in Kazakhstan also increase the country's overall energy consumption? And if so, uh, can growing crypto be considered responsible in the context of the unfolding crisis, climate crisis? Uh, crisis? I also think this, uh, the question could be uh, yours, Kanat. Yeah, for sure. The cryptocurrency and mining itself is in impacting the uh, global climate change. Yeah, as you know, for instance, the 
the energy that goes to to mining the crypto, the current cryptocurrency uh, Ethereum, it's uh, like the equal, equivalent to the con energy consumption of Serbia, like one 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 year uh, energy consumption, and it's huge huge amount of energy that consumed by the mining companies. For sure, uh, the renewable energy should be um, should be developed. For, for the mining because the existing the power uh, is, is not enough and this capacity is not good for the climate change as well. I can say the the example of uh, Ireland, yeah, the, they are using the volcanic uh, energy for the mining and it's a good solution uh, for countries who already launched the alternative uh, energy for own projects. And we should uh, be care about the environment and climate change because we now in this transition period and the, for during these two or three years, our uh, countries switch to their alternative sources. And this, my, uh, and this request from mining companies uh, should be covered by this uh, alternative energy and renew renewable energy uh, consumption. So I think mining companies should invest, like uh, huge investment companies should invest in the renewable uh, energy as well. Thank you, Kanat. Thank you, Kanat, for this answer. Uh, we have two questions uh, from, uh, from Aziz Birdukulov, um, uh, which uh, one reads to all the speakers. Um, I have the impression that majority of the Central Asian population is not aware of the cryptocurrencies, the technologies behind blockchain and NFT and etc. It might be rooted in a generally low financial literacy of the population in the region and suspicion of anything related to money you cannot touch. Who can change this perception and how? First of all, I think, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that it's not a question of financial literacy because even the billionaires uh, like in a, who top the Forbes uh, ratings, they're still suspicious to uh, Bitcoin, to all the blockchain things. So I don't think it's like, it's not like about the money you cannot touch or something. It's a question of trusting, like uh, trusting in something like uh, that people will, will follow the same pattern and finally it will be like it's like with the fiat with the fiat currency i believe it's like a fiat currency because as you know that none of the countries are using their like uh not supporting the fiat currency with the gold uh, and at first it seemed like oh yeah uh, those fiats like they can they can uh print it uh as much as they want and uh, now you can see that um, they're still printing it and it is based again on the belief in the country not in the actual like uh, uh, capacity of the country to support their fiat currency with the gold or something it's still like a, like a bubble also especially in, in the us they're just printing it and printing it Thank you, Sanjar. Would anyone uh, like to add anything to this? I can add, uh, add uh, that this perception can change only Uzbek state because uh, we are prohibited uh, to buy or to sell any crypto activities. That's why we have uh, low studies in this sphere. Thank you. Um, and the second uh, question uh, is addressed to Timur Palaev, uh, but other speakers uh, are free um, to answer it too. Uh, as you said, the internet is heavily mo uh, monopolized in Tajikistan, which creates barriers to the cryptocurrency sphere's development. I wonder why the government does not see freeing the internet as a channel to increase revenues. Cryptocurrencies can be convenient for Central Asian government at least, to employ people, diversify income sources, which would only positively influence the social cohesion in Tajikistan and any other country. The analogy I think is Belarus, also an authoritarian country, 
where the IT sphere is develop developing of a relatively free internet. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you, Aziz, for your question. I would like to answer. Uh, so uh, you said why uh, the government uh, does not free the internet uh, because as a channel to increase revenues. Uh, in the first place, I think they uh, uh, monopolize the internet because they want to control it. They wanted to control what comes in inside the country through the internet and what comes out, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and so on. And it seems to me that they put uh, control in this case over the possible revenues. So they rather have control and not having the possible uh, revenues from the internet. And uh, the other part of your question, yes, cryptocurrencies can be a convenient tool to diversify income sources, employ people and so on. But as uh, already been mentioned, uh, mainly I think it's the question of trust. Uh, mostly all around the world now, cryptocurrencies are not trusted uh, as heavy. And I believe if uh, in most uh, countries or maybe in the biggest countries, the cryptocurrencies will be legalized, uh, then Tajikistan will legalize them too. And analogy with Belarus, uh, I don't know about uh, uh, the situation of uh, cryptocurrencies in Belarus, but I think we should not put the mark of equation uh, between cryptocurrencies and the IT sphere uh, because uh, the cryptocurrencies can be banned in Belarus, but uh, the IT sphere can uh, you know, just develop as well. So I believe that this is the answer to your question as far as I could give it. And I hope you uh, satisfied. Thank you. I if I may, I might jump into this one too. Um, indeed, the, the scene in Belarus is quite developed for IT, but this is mostly for video gaming. So for example, World of Tank, which is one of the biggest success ever. So um, it's not the same kind of IT. Um, I guess we need to consider also the question of the topography and the whole geographic area, which means that if all the country in the world could have a super fast internet, they will do so. But sometimes putting some infrastructure and having access to internet, connecting it internationally is more complicated. So the case of Tajikistan is pretty problematic. Uh, so it also takes a lot to renew infrastructure and to increase the speed of the internet. So that's quite important to mention it. So in that case, topography is important for Tajikistan. Thank you, Michael. Um, and um, we have a question from uh, IWPR Central Asia. In a nutshell, what are the top three solutions to make gray miners white? Which successful country model in terms of uh, legal crypto regulation can be emulated in Central Asia? Uh, several speakers mentioned Turkey, Nigeria, Philippines, Canada, Argentina. Thank you. Well, I believe I can answer the question uh, <laughs> because it was in my presentation. So as you know, there's like white miners there. And the uh, top three solution, as I mentioned, is to bring your documents in the correct way like uh the the document should be exactly specified like uh that uh, they're provided for these miners for the exact company and for the data center so uh you just have to go in accordance with the law i know it's like in kazakhstan it's still not developed yet as we want to we have here like a kazakh like national um blockchain association and i'm in talks with the the head of their head uh, alan georgiev and currently we're trying to bring the legislation um to a better end like uh, we're trying to help the government to develop it um the government's still like uh in confusion because they don't know how to get the benefits from the mining from the crypto uh, for mining, there's like, uh, yeah, you, we will, we will uh, tax the consumpt, uh, consumpt electricity, but what about the crypto itself? Like, 
That is why it's prohibited. It's still prohibited here to own the crypto assets because uh, we don't know how to uh, how to tax it. Maybe in the future uh, we'll have some some patterns and legal framework for it. But currently, um, yeah, we have what we have. And um, in order to be a, like white miners, you just need to follow the regulation. You need to uh, notify the government once you come in Kazakhstan that you're going to mine and notify the, uh, the authorities that you're bringing the mining machines, cryptographic machines here. Then you just have to get the documents from the Electri electri electricity providers, uh, which shall indicate that you're mining, that you're not a gray. Like the gray mining is like you're bringing the uh, machines uh, without showing documents. Like you're saying there's a computer or something else. And then you just uh, find some, uh, for example, the, the, I don't know, like uh, some factory, some factory where you just put your machines there. Of course, they will be gray because you're not paying the taxes for the for the electricity consumption. You're just like paying taxes for the uh, for nothing. Like uh, they cannot see the where where the money come from, and that's why currently they're prosecuted. Uh, I myself, like uh, currently, also am a nominal director in two crypto mining companies. And we don't have any problems. Like we have like 100 megawatt uh, in capacity in the north part of Kazakhstan, but mm, we don't see any problems with that because uh, we 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 brought our documents into the right order. We notified everyone. We st we said like, yeah, we're gonna mine. That's it. And those who have problems in the news currently, as you as you. As you can see that there's like uh, there's some news from Kazakhstan that the gray miners were caught. They they don't have their documents in the right way. They just brought their machines here uh, seeking for the cheap electricity. They didn't want to pay taxes, and that's why they have problems right now. Thank you, Sanjar. It would be an answer from a white miner. I guess a straightforward one. Um, what about the second part of the question? Uh, which successful country model in terms of legal crypto regulation can be emulated in Central Asia? If anyone would like to jump on that. Yeah, may I add? So uh, again, the first one, um, the necessity of clear position from the government, it's really necessary for the white miners because when you don't have a clear position of your authorities you don't know what the future of your cryptocurrency on the mining company what the future of your investment in this company the second point what's about the other country experience for sure we should like using the practices from international market however we also should uh, account the national legislation uh, the national like the troubles issues that we face in central asia like corruption, like the bureaucracy. And we should also know that not all the legislation will work in our region. And we should pay attention to the, uh, legis the existing legislation in Russia, for instance. So the first one, the United States legislation is a good option for us um, to, to research it and to take some good, uh, some good practices, best practices. The second one, it's about the joint investments and is an example of Argentine where the Canadian companies, they have a joint construction with the government because uh, the example of weak governments where they, you don't have any other sources for your budget and it's not good for you. It's like you can't use the money for the constructions of new station that's why you can use the opportunities of investment and maybe this cryptocurrency is a way to solve your electric electricity um, capacity uh, trouble and the last point it's you can use the legislation of turkey or or another country only for uh taxation so to know how to taxate uh, this um this business because for now they are thinking like let's do additional 
prices or costs for electricity for these miners and maybe this bring us some money. But it doesn't work because you are doing like this electricity um, more expensive for them and they are coming, especially they are coming for cheap uh, electricity here. And you should think about the taxation in terms of the prices of the cryptocurrency in the global market. And it's not like fixed, like most of our economic works. It's more like flexible and the government should be flexible to the taxation and, and to, for doing exemptions. And we should go is a practice where they do some sustainable environment and sustainable business growth in your country. It's not about the fixed taxes that we are providing or the asking from these mining companies. It's more about the compromises that we are jointly uh, finding together. Yeah, if, I'm, if I may also jump in, uh, Kanat, maybe you can tell us more about Switzerland and also Iceland, because Iceland is considered as one of the hub for green energy in order to produce cryptocurrencies. And Switzerland is home to the Crypto Valley Association. So surely it seems that maybe those two countries, Switzerland and Iceland, can be good example. But I am no expert like you. Iceland is a good example and is a good option for Central Asian uh, region. They are using volcanic energy for its uh, for production of the for the mining, and the, we 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 should think about this country because a small one like uh, like Central Asian countries, one of them, like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and we have the sources of alternative energy. Uh, I also mentioned that we have had kind of project of white energy that was like projected in Isiko region and they are planning to build the wind energy um, there. And the Kazakhstan already had the uh, wind energy potential. And we should think about this because the Iceland uh, used their current existing sources for developing mine, mining in, in their region. And of course, it's a way to, to switch to renewable energy for us. It's not only about the getting money from them or it's not only about getting taxes from the miners. It's also about the development of the existing system or develop or switching to renewable energy. And Iceland is a good example where the infrastructure start to switch to the volcanic energy. And for us, it also can be opportunity to see switch from the uh, oil and gas. The price is still ongoing and rising day by day. We can use this opportunity and switch to the other uh, alternative sources. Like Thank you, Kanat. Um, I would uh, also like to ask a question. Uh, we really um, talked about the opportunities that cryptocurrency can bring in the region like uh, remittances uh, and um, fast money. But uh, what about the risks uh, that um, the cryptocurrency is uh, posing to um, to the states, um, like, um, and to the people. Uh, and I talk about uh, here, like, um, uh, risks of um, data privacy or money laundering. Um, uh, uh, are our states ready to kind of face the risks of that in Central Asia? And if I may add, sorry, uh, to Svetlana's question, basically one of the risks is financing of terrorist activity. I also have this question in mind and I thought, is there any way for the states to sort of, you know, address that? Thank you, sorry. Well, I don't think they can regulate these things. Like, uh, oh, they will not be able to do it here in Kazakhstan at least, because as you know, there's, uh, you cannot own lot, uh, cryptocurrency in Kazakhstan and thus you cannot just regulate it and see whether this money are going for terrorists or maybe other things. Um, thus, that's a question, I guess, for the, for the countries where the cryptocurrency flow, the possession, the transferring is, is not prohibited, it's legal. I may add it's um, like complex approach. So it's like, uh, like, yeah, such type of issues can be, 
and it's like uh, normal. Normally, we have like banks who are also transferring money. We have uh, people who are using the casino or another like uh, uh, ways of uh, money laundering. And it's uh, okay, uh, like when when they use these opportunities from internet. And I think that it's more about the complex approach. It's not about regulation of this sphere. It's more about the media literacy. It's more about the educated people uh, that that are aware about the uh, the money laundering. That they're aware about this uh, financing uh, financing of terrorist movements. Well, it's like an internet. We want to regulate internet, but however, it's not a good solution for our authorities because they are mostly like uh, monopolize the internet. And they think that we can say for the our security, we can regulate the internet and then block and ban all the, all the information that uh, seems like uh, dangerous for the government. However, the good approach when your people are aware, when they have uh, their own mind and educated, when they know how to do it. And I think I really believe that only in education is a sphere where you can regulate all the issues that come and they will come. However, the uh, amount will be smaller if we have educated people in our country. So it's the only one way to, to, to mitigate the terroristic attacks that the, the people who are going to Syria or Afghanistan because they really believe that they do a great job when they uh, know the consequences of the of these uh, situations, it can be helpful for the people. And I think that government should pay attention to education and media literacy more. And in that case, if I may jump in also, uh, it's depending if, because once again, cryptocurrency, uh, it's based on blockchain technology. So it's depending if it's state owned or decentralized. So if you're having, for example, a state such as China, who is having its own cryptocurrency, but which is owned by the central bank, so the central bank is in charge of everything, then in that case, um, you're not having the same result as if it is decentralized. Also, it's depending, for example, of the application that the average citizens are going to use. For example, when it's come to El Salvador, you are having the use of Chivo, so the Chivo wallet, which is uh, having issue of privacy. So the less privacy you have and the more security is. So that's also problematic on the one end, you know, like trading privacy for security. It sounds like a Benjamin Franklin saying in a certain way. Um, also, one important aspect is that terrorism existed and will keep exist. Um, it's only with cryptocurrencies you're making it faster for money transferring, but otherwise it will be by cash. It will be with people meeting in another place. It will be in the casino. Uh, casino is a perfect place when you do money laundering. So um, surely with cryptocurrencies that are not owned by the central bank, once again, in that case, you will increase the fast transfer, such as it has been seen with Monero, for example. But overall, uh, having the old-fashioned way, so which is with cash, is also the way we are funded. Uh, we are funding terrorism. Terrorism has not waited for, for crypto in order to arise, obviously. Sure. Uh, another one for me, uh, I know it may be too early to judge, uh, but um, how do you think uh, the, the sector uh, is in terms of gender balance? Uh, and do you think it has any prospects of um, either further, uh, 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 further disbalancing the benefits? From, uh, from the cryptocurrency or it has any potential to kind of balance uh, the incomes for men and women. Um, uh, those of you who are in, in, in the sphere, do you see any women in, in the sector? Well, we mostly see numbers. So it's like a user is just a number. There's no, no name and so on <laughs> most part of the time. Um, but surely it's like, it's mostly a male uh, dominated area. Um, but not because it's excluding women. It's like women are much welcome, actually. It's just that so far, it's a topic that many people, uh, it's actually Mila Kunis who recently mentioned that during a talk show. Uh, now I've got the attention of much more people. That's strange. But anyway, so we <laughs> mentioned recently uh, that it was mostly a male-dominated area. Um, and it's true, simply because uh, 
so far it has mostly attracted the attention of, uh, of men but there is more and more young women who are interested into it and on the future there is absolutely no reason that it will not be full parity or 51 percent women because you know there is 51 percent women and 49 percent men so it's absolutely not uh, discriminatory because there is only number and i hope that in the future there will be more women definitely <laughs> like the more people uh, the better of course no matter of where they're coming from and the gender and their age yeah, if I can add, it just depends on the on the person whether he wants to work in hot conditions or not. Because as you know, there most of the mining data centers are located at the rural areas, <laughs> where it's hard to get like uh, all the all the things you need, and it's like uh, sometimes it's like. Uh, they're in Kazakhstan. They're mostly located in the north part because the cold weather, mm -hmm. and not much women uh, wish to work there, mm -hmm. uh, especially engineers. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the person. But depending also because you've got yeah. societies such as Iceland and Switzerland, I mean, SUG is pretty woman friendly. Uh, and also it's like Iceland is one of the most, uh, let's say, women are in charge. I would even say that. So um, it's depending on the place. But true, it's like you, you, going to Central Asia, you're describing it very well. The, the proper miner was going to a former Soviet abandoned factory and building his own uh, business. So yeah, in that case, maybe Central Asia is having this, uh, I would not say issue, but uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because the working conditions are definitely different in Central Asia than, than in other countries such as Iceland. Th thanks a lot for that, actually. Yeah. Thank you. I, I can add that uh, this, this sphere is a new one. And when we have a new sphere, a new profession, it's really good for every gender because you don't have any stereotypes and biases in this sphere. You don't have any stereotypes about these professions. You can't say the minor only man or only woman. And it's a good opportunity for the gender equality when we don't have any bias. So, and I think that it's a good opportunity for all because you can open, you have open uh, sources, open knowledge about this mining and cryptocurrency. It's easy uh, to, to enter this sphere for the ordinary citizen. And it means no need to special like uh, education. I mean, the, the special degree to, to be a minor. And it's good for the uh, women who are now as a, a vulnerable in, in some countries and in some region due to the lack of education or the conservative uh, society. And I think it's more depending on the popularity of the mining and the popularity of the cryptocurrency and it's open for all and in new professions where the uh, women can become a, uh, a, a great example a role model for others so i think when you have a new spheres and new professions is a good way to 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 prove the gender equality thank you Kamat. thank you everyone for answers well let's let's hope uh, it's uh, a sphere where we um, could uh, observe um, at least uh, a tendency to, to equality. Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, if, um, uh, if any uh, left, please uh, let us know. Uh, I would like to um, pass the ball to Sergei uh, for a short wrap up before okay yeah all right yeah so thank you thank you very much for such a brilliant panel honestly i enjoyed it uh very much i think i think our wonderful speakers our wonderful keynote speaker our moderator and everybody who participated despite the fact that there were not many of us but i guess the video will be circulated across our social media which i uh, really urge you to follow at uh, three w dot Bar.asia, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, wh whatever else. Um, truly, uh, as Kanat mentioned, uh, uh, one of the last points that this is a new sphere, this is a new profession. And there were a lot of questions, as uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Lambert, mentioned. Uh, there, were, there are many more, more questions than the answers. But I guess uh, the panel tried, you know, to address certain, you know, aspects of what we discussed. 
especially my personal interest during this panel was the legal regulation of this uh, field, which is, I guess, uh, as, as Vidlana said, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be quoting a lot of people today. Uh, as Vidlana said, it's a term called indeed. And I think everybody's confused, whether it be state actors or international community or experts themselves or the miners. And actually, the question that I posed basically, how to become a white miner instead of great miner. It's a great thing like you just get get your paperwork straight and go to the state and get registered. But I guess it's not that simple. There might, there might be some underlying factors behind that. But yeah, once again, thank you every, uh, everybody for this great panel. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed the, the event. Um, yeah, we're gonna be publishing a highlight after, uh, after the panel. It will be available I think next week possibly, but I will be sending everything uh, to those who registered for the for the event. So yeah, thank you very much and have a great uh, rest of the day. Bye. Yeah, thank you, you Sergey, and also thank you to the whole IWPR team for